So, welcome. I'm deliberately going to stand on the red dot because I'm also a male, male person. So I have a little bit of a haantjes gedrag and I want to show that I'm different than uh, people who have uh, been standing here. So welcome everybody. Uh, I believe in feedback. And that will be my talk. And the applications will be robotics and cars. I will not talk about nuclear fusion plasmas, although they, they are very interesting. I will be talking about the role of feedback mechanisms in high-tech systems. But before I do that, some people with gray hairs might recognize this. This is from 40 years ago, this same building. It was the icon of stimulating engineering and technology uh, with younger people. A lot of us went here at least once a year with our parents and brothers and sisters. Uh, I still remember this robotic arm from an artist back in 1972. This robotic arm was in the entrance of the Evaluon, and when you entered and you talked, the robot moved to you. And then when you shouted to, to uh, firm, the robot retracted. So it was sort of a, a feedback, like the robot was a, a human, 1972. I still remember that. I was 12 years old at that time. Uh, it's a pity that the Evaluon does not play that role anymore. We should rethink about this. Uh, the principle of feedback. Uh, control engineers like block diagrams, right? So this is always where we start. Uh, you have a plant G to be controlled. That can be a human. That can be a car, where then K is the human, the controller. Uh, G can also be uh, a wafer scanner of ASML or a CD player uh, or a biological system. It can even be leadership. Uh, the best leaders use feedback to improve themselves with a high sampling rate. Yeah. So the ball game of feedback is to design K given G, modeling G, design K such that you suppress the effect of the disturbances D and that you follow the set points R. That's what I do every day. <laughs> I started to do this back in uh, the early 80s with my PhD thesis on wind energy. I was responsible for designing the control system for the speed of the blades and also for the pitch of the blades when the wind was too, uh, too uh, first. And I made this picture myself with my wife. We went to Friesland. This was the first wind power plant built in the Netherlands. That was at the time when the Netherlands was still number one with wind energy. And we lost completely uh, that industry, unfortunately. Then I moved to Philips, and that was a big change. So I was really motivated, long hair. Uh, I was motivated to work on wind energy, and then I had to work on CD players. Um, so I made a, a, a telling, a proposition in, uh, in, uh, in my PhD thesis at that time that CD players and wind turbine systems have more in common than you might think. And the common thing is control and feedback. Because the key working of a CD player is that the, the laser spot, without any contact, looks, looks to the disk and tries to follow the disk. And that's doing that using an optical sensor and an actuator in the arm of the CD player. Now, if you carefully look to the performance of such systems, we plot that often in the frequency domain. So on the horizontal axis, you see hertz. And this plot means that in the error signal, the following error, error signal, there is a lot of energy or power at 12.5 hertz and harmonics. And that is exactly the rotational speed of the disk for this application, 12.5 hertz. At that time, when I was working on this in Philips Research, the feedback system did not use the fact that the disk was rotating. It was simply, simply a PID controller used. PID controllers do not have memory buffers to record the rotation of the disk. And we worked on that and we applied that and you can see we could uh, take away all harmonics of the rotation of the disk by making a memory loop inside this controller K where you store the previous rotation of the disk. All CD players, DVD players, Blu-ray players, hard disk drives, they all have now repetitive control. This is repetitive control. This is not our invention. It was, of course, already in the 70s it was invented. So we worked specifically on a problem where the disk uh, speed could change a little bit. That was our contribution. But every laptop you have, if you put in a, a DVD, there is a, a memory loop inside the DVD player making the error signal really small. 
We are all proud of ASML, of course. I worked for a long time on ASML wafer scanners uh, when I was working in Philips Research. And still, I'm doing now a lot of research with uh, PhD and MSc students in my group. What is the, the, the beautiful thing about this machine? It is the most advanced motion system I know. It is behaving, uh, it is moving, uh, say 50 kilograms or 60 kilograms, with one or two or three G accelerations, uh, with accuracies which are better than two nanometers, which is about what my beard grows one day or so. Yeah? So it's so accurate, it's so accurate, and the, the, the um, way this has been achieved is by making beautiful mechanics, really beautiful mechanics, and very advanced control uh, feedback mechanisms inside. We are top, we are number one in the world in the technology to combine mechanical, electrical, software engineering, control engineering, uh, and optics and physics. We are number one in integration. 80% of all electronic devices sold worldwide have chips made on machines from Veldhoven. Amazing. In fact, the technology, the discipline goes back to the manufacturing of the Philips light uh, production streets, back in the 50s last year. It's called Megatronics. We are number one in Megatronics. <coughs> when I started working at Eindhoven University of Technology, uh, about 14 years ago, I thought, we are number one in this field. Why don't we put effort in making this also work for medical applications? So I started to work on medical robotics. And here you can see a commercially available medical robot, not from our uh, design. This is from a, from a, a US company. They have an installed base, I think now of 2,500 of such robots. Uh, you see the patient there, there's a slave robot system with various arms sticking inside the patient with minimal invasive surgery, yes, small holes. The surgeon is sitting at the left side, having handles to steer the robot. And he has vision, he or she has vision, beautiful 3D vision. I've, I've uh, been behind such a machine without patient, of course. <laughs> um, Beautiful vision. There are two major drawbacks of this machine. One, it is a rather bulky machine. We would never design such a machine in Eindhoven. <laughs> and the second one is that the surgeon does not feel anything. He does not have any feedback from the patient. He does not feel any force, only vision. So we uh, had a project where we designed a competitor system with same or even better specs, so we were more accurate at the tip, but we designed also force sensors inside this robot so that we could give the force signals to the surgeon so that he, in fact, could palpate again on distance. Now, this was a project by Linda van der Bedem, uh, one of our few female uh, engineers. Um, I'm, I'm really happy with this work. Uh, and at the same time, we also started to uh, work on an eye surgical application. And this is going even more accurate. The accuracy at the tip of this robot is about 10 microns. Uh, and the robot is intended to do operations at the backside of the eye, the retina. Um, there the veins are typically 25, 30 microns. And you would like to, to inject medicine inside those veins to make it possible that people see again. Uh, diabetes might, for instance, uh, result in occlusions in those veins, and you have to put medicine there for, say, 10 or 15 minutes, and uh, eye surgical uh, people cannot, held, uh, cannot keep the sticks uh, quiet for, for such a long time. A robot can. So we developed in our group this robot, uh, including, again, haptic feedback, because we designed a force sensor inside this robot as well. And for the first time, surgeons might even feel forces, because up to now the forces were so low, being doing it by hand, that they could hardly feel forces. But we can amplify the sensor signals, and we can give the force back to the surgeon. We are very close to, uh, uh, to some announcements uh, about this system, because uh, this is uh, really wanted by the eye surgical uh, um, doctors in the, in the field. Um, and from this, we went, of course, to soccer. Ah, 
Hier is daar al alle soccer playing robots. Can you tune the, the music a little bit down? Thank you. So we are now playing in the mid-size league uh, for six years. This is five against five, completely autonomous. These robots, they, they look for themselves, they think for themselves, they communicate uh, between themselves. They have a pet planning algorithm, of course. They try to find the, the goal of the opponent. We are very good in ball handling. You can see that the robot really is able to make turns, drive backwards, kick in the ball. <laughs> We're one of the first who really could pass the ball in a very accurate way. This is the Iran team, uh, our opponent last year. Stupid pass, of course, to us. You can uh, get a yellow or a red card if you are too uh, aggressive to your opponent. So, so we, we played for four years. For four years we were in the finals. And four years we became second. And that was two times against the Chinese team, one time against the uh, Portuguese team, and one time, and that was of course the most bad one, that was against a German team. But last year in Mexico City, last year in Mexico City, we became world champion. We, we, we uh, beat their the Iran, Iranian team. And that was just three weeks after our Dutch human soccer team was kicked out of the European Championships. Um, and I remember I was sitting in Mexico City making tweets, we are world champion. And that went really as a viral. And the most seen tweet I have uh, uh, observed at that time was, okay, This is great. We are world champions with uh, soccer playing uh, robots, and at least they don't have egos. <laughs> now, we do this, of course, with a purpose. We do this because we believe that in 20 years from now, we are in desperate need of people or systems which can help us in the elderly homes. So maybe Amigo can bring me a, a bottle of, of water now. Uh, so we developed a robot for the care sector uh, that's called Amigo. With Amigo, we are also, by the way, playing uh, in the RoboCup at Home League. Hi, Amigo. Good afternoon, Professor Steinbuck. Here is the bottle of water you ordered. Thank you. Eind van deze, uh, end of this month, uh, uh, from 26th of June until 30th of June, end of this month, we are organizing the World Championships Robo Cup in Eindhoven. It is a huge uh, um, uh, project, so to speak. 2,600 people are coming from all over the world, from 40 countries, with their teams to join us in the mid-size, the small-size, the simulation league, the now league the at home, the rescue league, there are a lot of things to see and do and I hope that you all will come there, it's for free to, to come and see and also please take all your children with you. So, let's go from robots to cars, because I uh, said I also wanted to talk about cars. Now this is sort of the picture I'm, I'm advocating to my students also, cars are becoming iPads on wheels. Now let's go first 100 years back. This is a car of my grand-grandfather. My grand-grandfather, so that's the grandfather of my father or the father of my grandfather. That's more easy to, to understand. Um, he wrote three books on automotive technology and is in one of his prefaces of his book he stated, in this time we say goodbye, so to speak, of the steam engine and we say goodbye to the electrical driven car, and we are facing a new era of combustion powertrains. Most cars at, that, at those days were fully electrically uh, powered. And he said, well, what is the drawback of electrical cars? Batteries are too heavy, the range is not uh, long enough, and they are too expensive. 100 years ago. Interesting, eh? <laughs> So this will be my car. Uh, last weekend, this weekend, I, I got a whole weekend this car from the shop in, in the Tesla store. 
I will get mine in August. It's an incredibly uh, expensive car. I've never bought a new car, by the way. I'm driving now in a Kangoo, second-hand Kangoo. So this is a major change for me, right? <laughs> and I'm paying it myself. We don't have a lease construction at the university, unfortunately. Yes? Um, this is an amazing car. This is a game changer. That's a Tesla car. The whole uh, 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 bottom of the car is batteries. You can drive, if you drive cautiously, 450 kilometers with one electrical charge. If you drive more aggressively, it will be 400. Maybe it's extremely cold, minus 20, it might drop to 370 kilometers. That's enough for me. I don't need chargers during the day because I never drive more than 380 kilometers a day. So during the night, I can just charge this car. The driving capabilities of this car are amazing. Please read my blog posts on the Tesla of the last weekend. Amazing. It has a huge iPad inside the car. If you want to have a new update of your software in your car, you just download it from internet. Yeah, the new, uh, the new capabilities of the car are downloaded by, uh, by internet. Amazing car, a game changer. The other, uh, and I'm, I'm uh, finishing, Peter, the, the other area where we do a lot of work and feedback is relevant is on smart cars. So here you see cars. If you stop them, you see that you get a sort of a shockwave in the, in the traffic jam. Now, if we now switch on feedback between the cars, so we add wireless connection between the, the mobile robots in this case, you can see that you can prevent the occurrence of shockwaves. If we now stop the first one, you see they all stop simultaneously. See that? That's also the role of feedback and feed forward in this application. We implemented this also on, on a two-car situation, and we tested that on the highway. Uh, I have no time to show that one, it's on the internet. And we also do tests also between Helmond and Eindhoven, together with a lot of parties, because this is work also in a consortium together. So, feedback sometimes goes wrong. And this is the video showing this. This video also shows for me that work should and is, in fact, fun. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>